This is Duke University. Thank you all for uh, coming today. Uh, I, uh, uh, I hope we will uh, succeed in opening your minds to the dimensions of a very serious and long-term social and political problem that our country's been facing for a long time and has no easy answers. And uh, one reason we're here today is because my friend George Liebman wrote an interesting uh, essay on it that inspired me to think, oh, we ought to be trying to do whatever we can do to uh, enable people to address this problem. Uh, George is a lawyer in Baltimore. Uh, he's a senior partner in a nice firm in Baltimore, and he's done a lot of other things over the course of his life. Uh, and uh, among them are uh, five books or six? More than that. I've read five. I don't know how many more there are. There are a bunch. Uh, he's sort of uh, uh, a professional historian as well as a, a, a profes professional lawyer. Uh, he's had a good deal of experience in politics as a ca sometime candidate uh, and uh, been involved in the governance of Maryland for uh, many years. And uh, he, uh, as I say, uh, I've been interested in this issue a little over the years, uh, have occasionally expressed the view that somehow we ought to be doing something, uh, and, uh, but never actually did anything or said anything. Oh, well, I guess actually I did uh, publish a little talk many years ago that uh, I gave on the subject. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it, it needs attention. And... Uh, George is going to explain how we got into this pickle and what we can do about it, if anything. Yeah. Huh? Mm. Yeah, thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, Paul has written on uh, every conceivable subject, including this one, as you can see if you ever look at his website. So I. Uh, as a writer, I don't uh, hold much of a candle to him. But I'm here today because of uh, a uh, pamphlet that a uh, little think tank that I run in Baltimore put out called Prohibition in Maryland, a collection of documents. And what I'm going to talk about is the drug war in the perspective supplied by alcohol prohibition because there are parallels and there are differences that are rather instructive and that are not too well known. Um, some of you may have watched the Ken Burns documentaries about national prohibition, which uh, certainly have some interesting and hilarious moments in them. Uh, but just how much of a remarkable disaster it was is not too well understood. Uh, alcohol prohibition, uh, like drug uh, prohibition, arose from a very real problem. There was a great deal of uh, drunkenness in the 19th century. Uh, uh, mining towns and factory towns and so forth, it certainly affected national productivity. There was a lot of brawling. There were open saloons that were open for 24 hours a day. There were uh, particular ethnic groups uh, notably the Irish, but not exclusively the Irish, who were noted for uh, alcohol uh, exuberance. Uh, and uh, I choose my words carefully in deference to the susceptibilities of today's, today's uh, students. Uh, and um, uh, there was a movement against it, which uh, in part partook to a significant degree of ethnic prejudice. There was a, it was part of the nativist upsurge that was a reaction to the large-scale uh, immigration into the United States during the 10 years following the turn of the 20th century. Uh, and that upsurge, of course, reached its maximum point uh, during and after the First World War. During the First World War, the Wilson administration uh, systematically cultivated uh, prejudice against German-Americans. Uh, and uh, after the war, there was the uh, 
the Red Scare, the deportation of native radicals, uh, restrictive immigration legislation sponsored by the unions, and the, the great movement led by the uh, Anti-Saloon League that was uh, then remarkably enough uh, led by a seemingly unrad unradical character, a Methodist bishop. Uh, we are not accustomed today to think of Methodists as a particular, particularly radical or revolutionary group, but on the subject of alcohol in the 19th century, both in Britain and in this country, they were quite passionate. And bishop Clarence Cannon was one of the leaders of the, the Prohibition Movement. Uh, the Prohibition Movement really got its start with an ordinance in Portland, Maine in 1872. Uh, during the war, uh, during the roughly one, one and a half years the United States was in World War I, uh, this country, as few people realize, became a virtual dictatorship. Uh, President Wilson assumed all kinds of powers that he probably didn't have. Uh, he nationalized the railroads. Uh, he imposed wage and price controls over essentially everything. And one of the things he did uh, is, was that under the aegis of his war power, he uh, imposed national prohibition. Uh, at the end of the war, uh, the Anti-Saloon League and its allies sponsored legislation to make prohibition permanent. And Wilson was against that, but only ineffectually so. He had had his stroke at that point. He did not resist the Volstead Act very strenuously. And so the Volstead Act was passed, and, and the 18th Amendment was ratified in 1919. One of the contributing factors to the ratification of the amendment uh, is thought to be women's suffrage. Uh, George Kennan, uh, in 1938, uh, as you will know from the recent biography of him, wrote a very jaundiced article about American politics in which, he, in which he took the view that women's suffrage was a terrible disaster, uh, largely on the strength of the 18th Amendment and the Hitler maidens in Germany. Uh, in the perspective of another 70 years, it's not been so much of a disaster, but that's how it looked after about 10 years in 1938, and largely because of the 18th Amendment. And what happened um, when the amendment was going through Congress and when the Volstead Act was going through Congress, there were people who were not enthusiastic about it. Uh, one of them was uh, the Honorable Warren Harding, a senate, then a senator from Ohio, and who was never noted as a passionate teetotaler. Uh, and he offered an amendment which would have extended the Volstead Act to simple possession. Uh, the act as enacted didn't include possession. It included only sale, distribution, and so on, manufacture. And uh, Harding's amendment was conceived as a wrecking amendment. He thought that if this were attached to the bill, no sane person would vote for it. Uh, and the amendment was defeated by a vote of something like 91 to 3 in the Senate. But the interesting thing um, to remember about Pro alcohol prohibition is that first it was thought necessary to have a constitutional amendment to legitimize it, and uh, second that it was in a number of important respects much less far-reaching than the drug prohibitions in the 1968 Drug Control Act. The 1968 Act, as you may know, contains no jurisdictional hooks whatever. It purports to extend to all drug sales in the United States, whether the drugs have moved in, com in commerce or whether they, the, uh, they directly affect uh, interstate commerce. And uh, that was apparently, and I use the word apparently advisedly, upheld by the Supreme Court in the Gonzalez versus Rage case about seven or eight years ago, to which I will return in a few moments. But prohibition, as I've said, was less far-reaching in jurisdictional terms and this made something of a difference because it made the cases hard to prosecute. In order to, for a prohibition agent to prosecute someone, as the operator of a speakeasy or a bar for violation of the Volstead Act, uh, it was not sufficient to go into the bar and seize the three bottles of Jack Daniels that were in plain view behind the counter and prosecute for prohibition for possession of alcoholic beverages. 
the prohibition agent actually had to consummate a sale. He had to uh, go in and actually purchase, uh, success, successfully purchase uh, uh, alcohol. And as a result, uh, the more prudent bar operators had closed doors and peepholes, and they would peep through the peepholes when people knocked. And if they knew who you were, they would let you in, and if they didn't, they wouldn't. There were two famous prohibition agents, uh, popularly referred to as Izzy and Moe, who uh, became celebrities for the, because of their gift for disguising themselves and gaining the confidence of bartenders. And, uh, but the prohibition agents as a whole were a pretty, pretty miserable lot because the, the enforcement of the federal, the 18th Amendment, was divided between the Treasury Department and the Justice Department. The uh, Justice Department, uh, in order to enforce prohibition, uh, created a new criminal division, which had not existed prior to 1920, because the only federal criminal statutes before that time related to such things as piracy and customs violations, and it wasn't necessary to have an office in Washington. The U.S. attorneys could do things perfectly well by themselves. So when they created the criminal division, uh, they nominated as its head a woman named Mabel Walker Willebrandt, uh, who um, was a very vigorous person, uh, noted for uh, descending on speakeasies with a hatchet in her hand, breaking down the doors at the head of the enforcement agents. Uh, she was also a nativist. She was very bright, but she was also a nativist. And in the presidential election of 1928 between Herbert Hoover and Al Smith, uh, Senator Robert Taft, who was then the Republican chairman in Ohio, he was then a state senator, was asked what he thought that uh, what he thought Hoover's chances were in Ohio during the course of the campaign, and his response was the only thing that could cause Hoover to be defeated in Ohio was a few more speeches by Mrs. Willebrand, because she had such a gift for inflaming the. Irish and German and other immigrant populations. But in any event, prohibition uh, took effect, and the Prohibition Amendment and, and, the, and the Volstead Act both contemplated concurrent enforcement by state governments. There's nothing like that, I might add, in, in, in the Commerce Clause, of course, and there's nothing like that in the Drug Enforcement Legislation of 1968. There's nothing that requires the states to purports to require the states to enforce drug prohibition. And, but after the enactment of the, little, of the Volstead Act, all the states save one enacted so-called Little Volstead Acts and themselves set up their own prohibition bureaus to enforce prohibition, although they never appropriated much money for them. The one state that didn't was my state of Maryland, which thereafter was popularly referred to as the free state as a result of its stubbornness in this respect. And the architects of that stubbornness were um, two people, the then governor, Albert Ritchie, who served five terms as governor between 1916 and 1935. He was governor when the Volstead Act took effect, and he was also governor when the 21st Amendment was ratified and prohibition was repealed. And during the intervening period, he uh, attracted a lot of criticism for his stubbornness and his refusal to enforce the act in Maryland. And he liked to point out that at that time, the crime rate in Baltimore was lower than that in any other American city because the police could uh, devote themselves to crimes of violence rather than chasing uh, dealers in alcoholic beverages. It's not now lower than that in any other American city. It's, uh, <laughs> one of the higher rates, and the murders are almost all uh, murders uh, of and by teenage drug dealers <laughs> assassinating each other. But in any case, um, Ritchie was stubborn, and there was never any Prohibition Act in Maryland. And uh, far from this operating against him politically, uh, it, he was able to get reelected four times. And when he finally failed of reelection, it was because of his skepticism about the New Deal and also because he came down very hard on a lynching on the eastern shore of Maryland in 1934 and the people down there didn't like it. 
But um, Ritchie had a very potent ally in his opposition to prohibition in the person of H.L. Mencken of the Baltimore Sun, who was then the foremost journalist in the United States. And his columns not only ran in the Sun, but uh, in a variety of other newspapers across the country. And uh, Mencken made it his mission to not permit a day to pass, literally, when the Sun didn't take some swipe at that, uh, that national prohibition. And he did this in verse, he did this in song, he did this uh, with anecdotes in his newspaper column, he just never let up. And uh, one of the effects uh, of alcohol prohibition, uh, the most, one of the more dramatic illustrations of it, was depicted in a speech by a, a Maryland senator who was also a vehement opponent of prohibition, uh, a man named William Cable Bruce, who gave a speech uh, in the Senate in 1926, which uh, contained uh, some rather arresting statistics. Uh, before the enactment of the Lever a Act on August 10, 1917, which forbade the manufacture of whiskey for beverage purposes, the entire number of licensed distilleries in the United States was 507. And during the fiscal year ending June 30, 1919, when the last year when the production of beer was permitted, the entire number of breweries in operation was 669. Under pre-prohibition pre pre conditions, there were practically no illicit plants except in certain secluded communities. During the fiscal year ending June 30, 1925, 172,537 illicit distilleries, still, still worms, and fermenters were seized by the National Prohibition Unit. So there was this extraordinary explosion in, in uh, the manufacture of various forms of alcohol. Now, how did the Prohibition uh, movement come to an end? Uh, it came to an end in political terms as a result of the coalition of two groups. The first group were the pre-prohibition producers of alcohol who had managed to stay in business during prohibition because pro the Prohibition Act contained a number of striking exceptions. The, there was an exception for industrial alcohol that kept the distillers in business, although people uh, had the quite frequently made the mistake of buying industrial alcohol and going blind by trying to drink it. Uh, the brewers stayed in business by making a substance called near beer that was still legal, and it was sort of like the non-alcoholic beers like O'Doul's that you can buy today that were less than half of 1% alcohol. That was the legal line. The only trouble with the exception for near beer is that the process of brewing is such that it's impossible to make near beer without making real beer first. Uh, you make the real beer and then it gets diluted in various ways. So, and surprisingly enough, a good deal of the real beer that was manufactured uh, somehow leaked from the system and got into the marketplace. Uh, similarly, the wine people stayed in business by uh, uh, producing kits of dried fruit and providing people with instructions for adding yeast and setting up an apparatus in their bathtubs to uh, produce wine. Uh, Ms. Willebrand, incidentally, after President Hoover refused to reappoint her, uh, became a lobbyist for the wine industry, which is rather amusing. Uh, but the, uh, and the other exception in the law, uh, which was not a too important an exception, was uh, for farmers making cider on their own uh, farms. Uh, this last exception uh, provided an irresistible opportunity for Mencken. Uh, Mencken had a friend uh, who owned a uh, large house uh, in a very central location in Baltimore at the intersection of Charles and Franklin Street in the middle of what was then the business district. And the uh, house had a large backyard, and in the backyard there was a large maple tree. And Mencken caused his friend to uh, order several crates of apples, which then were tied to the maple tree with string and there was then a party at which uh, the apples were fed into a cider press. 
uh, to the accompaniment of great joy, and in order to ensure that the party was a complete success, Mencken and his friend notified the local prohibition agents, who remarkably enough were stupid enough to descend upon the scene and level federal charges against uh, Mencken's friend for uh, running an illicit uh, uh, still. Uh, and he, uh, a prosecution took place before uh, Judge W. Calvin Chestnut, who was a very able but very straight-laced federal district judge. The defendants, as one would expect, were triumphantly acquitted and carried on the shoulders of their constituents out of the courtroom. Uh, so there were absurdities about national prohibition, but the, the, the lobby for its repeal was a lobby that doesn't really have an equivalent in the drug context. It uh, was a lobby of the former producers. There was a second element to the lobby uh, for repeal, and that, interestingly enough, was provided by the very rich. Uh, during the Harding and Coolidge era, uh, Andrew Mellon was Secretary of the Treasury and prided himself on sharp reductions in income taxes. There hadn't been any income taxes before the First World War, but during the war an income tax was introduced to pay for the war, and Mellon uh, set to work with a will to get as much of it repealed as he could, and he was quite successful. By the time he was through, there were only a few hundred people in the country who paid any income tax. And he was one of them. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there was some politician from one of the Midwestern states who was unkind enough to point out that Mellon's taxable income at one point exceeded that of the entire population of Nebraska, to which Mellon's rejoinder was that he paid more taxes than the entire population of Nebraska. <laughs> but unbelievable though this may seem, it was true. But the coalition to uh, repeal prohibition uh, importantly included uh, people like the DuPonts and others who were quite rich and their hope was that if prohibition were repealed that the reinstituted alcoholic beverage taxes could replace the income tax and what was left of the income tax could be gotten rid of. Um, now as you know in 1928 there was the Hoover Smith campaign and Governor Smith of New York, Al Smith, who of course was an Irishman and a Roman Catholic and aroused a lot of prejudices in the pro Protestant areas of the country, was a strong advocate of uh, repeal. Uh, uh, Smith, uh, uh, of course, was uh, unsuccessful in that campaign. He again ran against Roosevelt for the nomination in 1932 and Roosevelt did not want to be outbid by Smith on the repeal issue. So Roosevelt took an unequivocal position uh, in favor of repeal during the course of the uh, election uh, campaign. Hoover, uh, in the meantime, uh, was less passionate for prohibition than Harding and Coolidge. Uh, he began to slowly and indecisively back off his support of prohibition uh, most famously uh, by referring to it uh, as an experiment noble in purpose, which is how the phrase noble experiment got into the language. And he appointed a study commission, the Wickersham Commission, uh, of very eminent people to study not only prohibition but law enforcement generally. And a lot of the recommendations of the Wickersham Commission became quite important. The Wickersham Commission did a study of the third degree uh, of the custom of beating confessions out of people that was quoted by the Supreme Court uh, in the Miranda decision and influenced discussion for many years thereafter. But on the issue of prohibition, the 12 or so members of the Wickersham Commission, with one exception, all temporized. They, they said, we realize this isn't working. Uh, we realize there are terrible abuses. We realize that it hasn't really done too much to quench the flow of alcohol. But if it's repealed, this, that, and the other terrible thing may happen. And therefore, we stop short of repeal in our recommendations, which all but one of them did. The only one who unequivocally supported repeal was a lawyer from New Orleans named Monty LeMann, 
who recommended that the whole subject be returned to the state governments. And that was the position taken by Roosevelt when he became president. The repeal of prohibition when it took place, took place, uh, came about in a very astute way, and there's some lessons in this also. Um, the, uh, Roosevelt realized that the definitions of beer and wine uh, in the, uh, in the uh, statutes were somewhat soft and arose from regulation. I mean, uh, 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 and, and there was really nothing in the 18th Amendment that really defined these substances. So in the early days of his administration, he was able without much difficulty during his honeymoon period, and I think it was actually the first act that he got passed, and it was passed about three or four days after he took office, the Beer and Wine Tax Act of 1933 uh, defined beer as being, uh, I believe, 3.2% alcohol rather than a half of 1% alcohol, so that a lot of beer could now lawfully be sold and he did something similar with wine. He couldn't do anything about the distilled spirits at that point. And then later in the year, about 12 months later, uh, he had asked for state conventions to consider the 21st Amendment on the theory that they would be less subject to the dry lobby than legislatures. And, uh, and the necessary number of states ratified the amendment within a year. And uh, thereafter, um, there was... Uh, enacted uh, the Federal Alcohol Administration Act designed to extract taxes from the industry. And Roosevelt had a good sense of humor about his political appointments because he appointed to be the head of the Federal Alcohol Administration a man named Joseph Choate, who was the grandson of the lawyer who successfully brought the income tax case in 1895 and invalidated the income tax. Choate was one of the people who wanted to get rid of the income tax, so Roosevelt not illogically felt that he would be an enthusiastic collector of alcoholic beverage taxes. Choate ultimately was disillusioned with Roosevelt because Roosevelt didn't reduce the income tax. On the contrary, he increased it, and he was one of the leading supporters of Alf Landon and the Liberty League in the 1936 election. But that, uh, and what, of course, replaced... Uh, prohibition was um, state and local option on prohibition. There were a number of states that maintained prohibition, notably Mississippi, Kansas, and Oklahoma. Uh, and it was not until uh, the 1960s that those three states repealed their bans on the sale of alcoholic beverages. There are still quite a few American towns and counties that ban alcoholic beverage sales. The states have widely varying uh, practices with regard to the sale of alcohol. Uh, in this state, if I recall correctly, uh, distilled spirits can be sold only in state liquor stores. Uh, in, in the, uh, when I was in the Army in South Carolina in the, the 1960s, you couldn't buy liquor by the drink in restaurants. You had to bring the proverbial brown bag. In, oh, in Utah, prohibition on sale of liquor by the drink was just repealed in the last couple of years, and there are still laws in Utah that prohibit any bottles from being in, in plain view in bars and restaurants. Uh, if you order a drink in Utah, uh, the waiter uh, slinks off somewhere backstage and comes, comes forth with the glass uh, at some later time. Uh, but uh, in any, and in, in Maryland, uh, Governor Ritchie, true to his convictions, uh, passed, uh, urged and got an enactment of a statute which provided for almost complete county option on alcoholic beverage sales. The liquor laws in Maryland are theoretically state laws, but they are written by the county delegations. And in Montgomery County, there is a, state li a county liquor monopoly that's been extremely profitable for Montgomery County. Uh, in some of the eastern shore counties, there may be one liquor store uh, hidden up a creek somewhere, and that's all there is. But uh, in general, I think people realize there's a great problem with alcoholism and alcohol abuse in this country. But it's not a political problem. Uh, it is not a problem which uh, poisons the political system. It's not a problem that gives rise to widespread loss lawlessness. Illegal sales now are quite limited and 
guess there are people in the backwoods of North Carolina who still have their own stills, but there aren't very many of them, and it's not economically terribly important. And so you have this whole tremendous apparatus uh, of an illegal industry that vanished almost overnight with the repeal of prohibition. And that brings me to the drug war. Uh, the drug war, uh, in a serious sense, uh, got underway in 1937 uh, when Harry Anslinger, who was the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which up to that point had involved itself only with things like opium, uh, uh, gave some frightening speeches about the supposed ills of marijuana. And with the acquiescence of the Roosevelt administration, there was enacted in 1937 a statute called the Marijuana Tax Act. Uh, the object of the Marijuana Tax Act, in essence, was to render marijuana use and sale illegal or economically prohibitive. And the reason the taxing power was used was because, in the view of the Commerce Clause that had been espoused by the Supreme Court in the middle 30s, it was thought that any attempt to regulate drug sales under the Commerce Clause would have constitutional difficulties. So instead, Anslinger got this tax. Uh, the tax is interesting for two reasons. Um, it was a dollar an ounce, which was prohibitive then. I don't think it would be prohibitive now. There was an exception in it, oddly and interestingly enough, for med medicinal marijuana, which was known in the 1930s as well as now. And any marijuana that was prescribed by a doctor was taxed only at the rate of 10 cents an ounce under the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. You won't find the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 in the United States Code, but it has never been repealed. And the reason it's not in the code was that the Supreme Court held, in a perfectly correct opinion by Justice Harlan in the early 1970s, that uh, it could not be validly enforced with this federal prohibitory statute in effect because um, you couldn't prosecute it without infringing the privilege against self-incrimination, so that as long as there was a federal prohibition on marijuana possession, sale, and so forth, the federal government could not successfully tax uh, the marijuana industry or prosecute people for not paying the tax. And the interesting thing about this is that if the, uh, the prohibition, which I'll come to in a moment, were repealed or modified, the tax would automatically spring into existence again without the need of further action by Congress. Indeed, those favoring the uh, legalization, if you will, of marijuana would be in the happy position of being able to go to Congress and saying, uh, we know you don't like to vote to legalize drugs, and so we're giving you an opportunity to tax marijuana more heavily and raise, consistent, uh, raise increased revenues from it. All Congress, all you Congress have to do on this issue is raise the tax, and you don't even have to do that if you don't want to, although it, might be, it would probably be a good idea and would make this whole thing go down more uh, successfully. Now, why do I say that that's all Congress needs to do? Uh, I say this because of the peculiar structure of the 1968 drug law. The 1968 drug law, in effect, says that any drug that is classified as being a addictive drug, I forget the exact terminology, by the regulatory agency, which I think is the FDA, um, can't be distributed, sold, uh, et cetera, in interstate commerce with certain exceptions. And there are five categories of drugs. The first category are drugs that are deemed to have no valid other use. And guess what is in the first category that attracts the most draconian prohibitions and penalties, marijuana, even though most people concede, even though Congress in 1937 even conceded that marijuana had a medical use. Nonetheless, it is, it is one of the most dangerous drugs. It's more highly classified than uh, heroin and cocaine, which are conceded to have medical uses, which doctors can prescribe. And there are three or four gradations of uh, drugs in the federal schedules. Some of them are um, drugs which can be validly prescribed on certain schedules. There's one that can be prescribed, some that can be prescribed by physicians only four times a month, 
some that can be prescribed more than that, uh, and so on. So by the simple expedient of classifying marijuana downwards, whether classifying it as being completely innocuous or classifying it as a drug which can only be acquired by a, a prescription four times a month or 12 times a month or whatever, uh, the regulatory agency, which is appointed by the president and generally listens to what he has to say, could legalize marijuana without Congress being involved at all. And this, is, this means that for a politician, the task of doing something about this is much less onerous than the task that confronted President Roosevelt in 1933, where he had to get first a statute and then a constitutional amendment. But it hasn't, I have not seen the drug issue discussed in these terms because no one has gotten down to brass tacks about what repeal uh, would really look like. And that brings me to what seems to me the great failure of advocacy that has taken place on the part of those who favor liberalization of the law. Uh, their arguments have been purely libertarian arguments. They seem to argue that people can ingest what they want and there's no harm in this stuff and uh, therefore uh, uh, we should repeal these silly laws. Um, and I do, I do not, as a personal matter, agree with that proposition. There is harm in marijuana. Um, and the harm takes several different forms. Uh, and legalization is an important way of getting at the harm uh, as distinct from uh, denying it. Uh, one harm is the, is the problem of the spaced out student. Virtually nobody uh, dies of marijuana, but a great many, uh, and I've heard this from any number of high school teachers particularly, I, uh, I, I want to exonerate Paul Carrington from any accusation of this sort, <laughs> but I've heard a great many teachers say that there are people in their classes who um, are not all there uh, because of uh, either they're hung over with alcohol or they are, they are on cloud nine because of marijuana or some other uh, substance. Uh, indeed, um, I think it can be plausibly argued and uh, uh, that uh, our last several pairs of presidential candidates managed to pass through their undergraduate careers uh, virtually untouched by the curriculum because they were vigorously imbibing various <laughs> substances. And if you go down the list, uh, uh, we have, of course, uh, the incumbent, Mr. Obama, who in spite of his enthusiasm for autobiography was remarkably silent about his college years in both his books. Uh, you have George W. Bush, who uh, may or may not have used cocaine, but who was a, certainly a great enthusiast for alcohol use in his college years and had a C or D average. I, I think his average was somewhat better than that of John Kerry, who had a D average. There was Kerry, there was Al Gore, who uh, likewise uh, was uh, what may politely be called a late bloomer. Uh, he uh, did not do well in college. He dropped out of divinity school. He dropped out of law school and so on. And it is quite true that uh, since, uh, since those two Puritans, George H.W. Bush and Michael Dukakis, uh, we have not had an election that uh, included... Uh, two candidates that were fully compos mentos in their undergraduate years. And you may think that's unimportant and that what people learn or don't learn in college has nothing to do with how they perform afterwards, but I, I don't think I share that view. Uh, but that is one way of dramatizing the costs of marijuana. And if you were going to address the problem of marijuana use by students, the way to do it is quite clear through some form of testing, compulsory or voluntary drug testing. And the colleges have not wanted to do this, and the high schools have not wanted to do this for two reasons. Uh, the, the first reason is they know there are criminal prohibitions on possession of this stuff, and they don't want to incriminate their students by uh, having them fail drug tests. The second uh, reason is that those School districts that have uh, attempted to drug test their students have gotten, almost invariably gotten lawsuits from the ACLU, uh, 
And there was an early case, the Karlstadt case in New Jersey, where the ACLU got a very large award of attorney's fees against the school district under the Civil Rights Attorney's Fees Act, which they vigorously publicized and which has been a great deterrent to the bringing of suits of this case, a great deterrent to the introduction of drug testing in schools, even though the Supreme Court has, on, on at least two occasions, upheld drug testing of athletes, and, and in dictum, five members of the court have indicated that general drug testing would be constitutionally unassailable. But yet it hasn't been tried, even though, I would argue, the only effective way of discouraging drug use is testing. Uh, the military in the post-Vietnam era, where it had an enormous problem of drug abuse, dealt with it quite successfully through the device of compulsory testing. And um, it's true that the military has a grip on people that is somewhat more uh, profound than high schools and colleges have on their students. Even the tyrannical Duke Law School uh, <laughs> uh, it doesn't have too much control uh, over uh, you folks. But, uh, but it is true, uh, uh, and th there was a second use made of uh, drug testing, and that was uh, during the Reagan administration when Bill Bennett, of whom I'm not a great admirer, was the drug czar. Uh, the government vigorously promoted drug testing by employers. And if you want to get a job at Giant Foods or Honeywell or any large company, you have to take a drug test and be periodically drug tested. And that seems to have stopped the penetration of drug abuse into the middle class, at least the white middle class, the black middle class also. So drug testing, is whatever you may think of it, uh, is not ineffective. Now, you can make all kinds of abstract arguments about bodily integrity, which I don't find awfully compelling for various reasons not necessary to be gone into. But um, uh, there it is. If you want to attack this problem, the most effective way to attack it is through testing, not through criminal prosecutions where you, you have to establish, uh, uh, you have to avoid self-incrimination, you have to avoid illegal searches, you have to have jury trials and all these other inconveniences that quite properly make people difficult to convict. Uh, and so the slogan that I think that the advocates of legalization, quote, end quote, should be using is not, uh, we got a right to do this, it's harmless, it's perfectly wonderful. Uh, the slogan uh, really should be less is more, that the criminal uh, sanctions uh, deter the use of more effective approaches to the curbing of drug abuse. Um, another um, another um, argument that's frequently made by the defenders of the existing prohibitions are that, uh, is that the, uh, the prohibition um, um, operates to keep people away from marijuana, which they call a gateway drug, and that people who use marijuana um, are likely to move on to harder and more harmful drugs. The trouble with that argument, uh, aside from the fact that the empirical evidence is rather weak, uh, is that to the extent that people move on from marijuana to harder drugs, it is in no substantial measure because the acquisition of marijuana introduces them to illegal drug dealers who deal also in other substances. So that if marijuana is made legal, uh, presumably they will buy it lawfully and will not be introduced to these evil people who tell them about the delights of heroin and cocaine and so forth. Uh, another uh, refrain that one hears is that the power of the alcoholic beverage lobby has been such to keep alcoholic beverage taxes quite low and that the legalization of marijuana will not produce significant fiscal benefits for either the state or local governments. The trouble with that argument is that uh, the benefits uh, from legalization do not derive from excise taxes. They derive from ordinary uh, payroll, income, and sales taxes, none of which are paid by the illegal marijuana industry. And if you believe the doomsday criers in the federal drug agencies, 
a not inconsiderable part of the gross national product is accounted for by the illegal drug trade. I don't know what the percentage, three to five percent is one rather commonly used number. Uh, people have even gone up as high as 10 percent. Well, we have a, an $18 trillion economy in which there are about $4 trillion a year in federal taxes. And uh, three percent of four trillion is a real big number. It's $120 billion uh, of taxes that are now being collected uh, from the illegal drug industry and just the marijuana part of the illegal drug industry. So uh, I'm not persuaded by the argument that the lobby is going to be so strong that it's going to hold down taxes. It may hold down excise taxes, but it's not going to hold down payroll taxes, corporation taxes, individual income taxes, and so forth. The, another argument that's frequently used is that the, uh, the uh, marijuana use, even though it isn't lethal, uh, produces uh, a lot of visits to emergency rooms because of, quote, bad trips, uh, impurities in marijuana and so on. And also that, uh, however harmless it may have been in the past, some of the recently introduced strains are more harmful than those in common use when you were young and innocent and college students. <laughs> and the trouble with that argument, in my view, is that if there were legalization, there was then scope for standardizing the product and regulating the product. Um, we may not like what the tobacco companies do, but uh, the, the tobacco companies are required to report on the percentages of nicotine and tar in their products, and that kind of thing can even be regulated. And uh, if you're concerned about lack of standardization, uh, the way to deal with it is through legalization and a regulatory regime. Now, why hasn't much happened? <laughs> there is... Uh, there was a, Cal a referendum in California two years ago that narrowly failed as a result of the last-minute intervention of the Obama administration against it. Obama is terrified of being seen as soft and cri on crime. Um, I think there's another referendum coming up, although I haven't followed the California situation with any care. I think if, if such a thing were to happen in California, a lot of things that happen in California first have a way of spreading across the country, and I think this might be one of them. But um, aside from that possibility, and what you have in California is kind of a grassroots movement that's largely driven by uh, libertarians and landowners uh, more than uh, by uh, um, any wider coalition, uh, but what, what I think might precipitate change in this area is uh, one of the things that precipitated change at the time of prohibition, and that is the spillover into the United States of serious gang warfare of the sort that's now going on in northern Mexico. One of the things that made a dramatic impact on public opinion during prohibition was the St. Valentine's Day massacre in Chicago a year or two before Prohibition re was repealed, where two alcoholic gangs went after each other in the streets of Chicago with machine guns. And the battle lasted for several hours and left eight or nine people dead. That made an impression on public opinion nationally. Now, there is a lot of carnage resulting from the uh, illegal drug trade. Uh, it tends to be confined to uh, the ghetto areas of large cities, and the murders tend to take place uh, one at a time, although in Baltimore, uh, in, in keeping with our position of leadership in these matters, there was a, <laughs> there was a terrible episode about 10 years ago where um, a woman who informed on the drug dealers in her neighborhood uh, got her house uh, attacked with a Molotov cocktail that killed her and four of her children. This created a momentary sensation, and uh, our then mayor, who is not an intellectual giant and is now governor and now wants to be president of the United States, uh, Martin O'Malley, responded to this by uh, distributing large black and white stickers uh, bearing on them the single word, believe, 
this was supposed to raise somehow civic morale. Uh, there was a criminal lawyer of my acquaintance who uh, was then running for state's attorney, he didn't make it, who responded to this by distributing uh, similar stickers reading, behave. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Uh, but in any event, uh, and uh, O'Malley uh, has, um, I'll, uh, how bad it is uh, in, in Maryland, there is a medical marijuana bill that nearly passed at the last session, and the state health secretary staved it off by saying, we've got to study this, we've got to study this, we really ought to allow distribution of medical marijuana only through one or two hospitals uh, who can study this, Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland. So a commission was appointed the commission re uh, rendered two reports. The majority report recommended uh, the same kind of medical marijuana system as now exists in about a dozen other states. Uh, the minority report signed by the health secretary recommended this two hospital system. And thereupon, and the bills were introduced in the legislature, and thereupon the governor commanded his health secretary to oppose both bills which the health secretary, uh, instead of resigning, proceeded to do. And the legislature is still in session. It's not clear what will happen. But uh, in terms of uh, political perfidy, I think uh, that performance is rather hard to top. Uh, there are very few politicians who have been willing to st stand up on this issue. And that is because um, there isn't too much uh, in the way of organized effort on the part of people who are not seen as part of a libertarian fringe to induce reform. There is one major development that's taken place lately. About three years ago, there was the report of the Latin American Commission on Drugs and Democracy that was signed, uh, among other people, by former President Gavilia of Colombia, former President Zidio of Mexico and the former President Cardozo of Brazil and the very conservative uh, Peruvian economist Alberto uh, Vargas Losa, all of whom said that the United States should legalize marijuana, that its illegality was having a devastating effect on the societies of Latin American countries uh, where uh, the drug trade was becoming increasingly powerful as a result of our imports of marijuana. And there has since been a, an even more broadly based international commission, which, is, which included uh, <coughs> former chairman for, uh, Paul Volcker of the Federal Reserve Board and former Secretary of State George Schultz, who made some, which made similar recommendations. But all of this hasn't prevented um, people, politicians who, who advocate this view as being depicted, as being marginalized and depicted as some sort of flower child. Lest I be misunderstood, let me say that I have never partaken of marijuana. And I think that's true of, I dare say it's probably true of Paul Volcker and George Schultz also. But uh, I think that uh, the time may be coming, and whether it's precipitated by a, a massacre of some kind or by a referendum in California or by, or by a, a president who's a lame duck and feels he has nothing to lose, um, I think that there is change that's coming in this area, and I think uh, change is justified. And now I'll be happy to take your questions. I've gone on for longer than I planned. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, so I just recently saw a documentary called Cocaine Cowboys, and it was about Miami in the 1980s and all the violence that went on there. Why didn't that violence to, so in, there was a public backlash, and it was from the Reagan administration who kind of doubled down on enforcement rather than shifting toward, a, you know. Yeah. I, I'm personally, I think prohibition is the worst of all situations, but that's not what I'm going to ask. Well, I mean, there's the empirical argument that th th there are surveys of marijuana use that have been conducted for the last 40 years where... Uh, this doesn't involve resort to arrest statistics. It involves going out and asking people, have you used it in the last 30 days and used it in the last 90 days? The levels of use have been remarkably constant, even though every drug czar since has claimed that uh, things have gotten better on his watch. 
if that's true, it's rather rather hard to show, uh, hard to understand why the rate is the same as it was before these ten or fifteen geniuses uh, occupied their offices. Uh, so that, um, but the other the other thing that startles people are the dimensions of the arrests. There have been, uh, there are roughly three quarters of a million marijuana arrests a year in the United States, which means over a twenty year period, fifteen million people have acquired arrest records. Uh, and the other interesting thing to me is that uh, the usage, the most recent usage survey in Maryland is rather out of date. It only goes up to about 2004, 2005. There's a unit at the University of Maryland that did this kind of thing. And the rate of usage um, in Maryland was not, as you might think, greatest in Baltimore City which is about two-thirds black, or PG County, which is now about 80% black. The rate of usage was greatest in uh, what might be described as declining uh, industrial communities, uh, notably Hagerstown and Cumberland. And I suspect that's true. Um, you know, I suspect the Flint, Michigans of this country and the St. Louis's and the Detroit's uh, have very and the suburbs of these places uh, have very high rates of abuse. Uh, someone said to me yesterday that, uh, that in Vermont the main problem is oxycodone and that if marijuana were legalized that problem might disappear because uh, people would take marijuana which is less harmful than oxycodone. Uh, but um, I do think the time is coming when there's going to be change here, and uh, I think the, w the way to ensure that it happens in a reasonably orderly fashion is for more people to be heard concerning it. Yeah, any other questions? Yes. Um, may I kind of throw in years back that I care to tell you? Um, when I was an undergraduate at the University of California at Berkeley, we did have a lecturer who felt that marijuana was more dangerous than heroin or cocaine because it could make changes at the DNA level that could actually be inherited by subsequent generations. I haven't heard that since then, but there is a lot of study going on now with epigenomics and the fact that um, environment can change genetic expression. Um, I guess my question is, at what point do we really start looking at that, and does that become persuasive one way or another as far as what we do with this? I mean, clearly this is a huge problem, and we can't be well, I, st I still come back, I, even if you grant, and as I said earlier, that there are dangerous strains of marijuana, the way to ensure that the product that's commonly sold doesn't partake of most of these dangers is to make it a regulated commodity, not to prohibit it. Because you have no control whatever of what's being sold if it's, pro if it's uh, prohibited. And in fact, uh, if it's both prohibited and expensive, people are going to want to buy the strongest possible stuff simply because it's cheaper uh, for the high you get. Um, so I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I think a lot of that kind of writing is, uh, as lawyers say, post litem motem. I would look very closely at the associations of the people who put forth the scare stories. Yeah, uh, I think this is clearly not a conservative speaker. This is actually someone who wanted to um, liberalize cocaine use. <laughs> <laughs> and but again, even if it's true, you have to weigh that against uh, a situation in which, number one, the vocational option of choice in many inner cities is becoming a drug dealer because it's so profitable. And number two, uh, a level of violence which by international standards is quite extraordinary. Yes. Um, you focus a lot on the benefits of legalizing marijuana. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the issue with cocaine, given that it seems to be the driving, uh, the driving factor in the, in the gang problem in Mexico and a lot of Latin American countries. And it seems like it's not that uh, simple to legalize cocaine. No, I, I agree that it isn't. And in fact, uh, Heroin is a better candidate for legalization than cocaine because heroin, as I understand it, if a heroin addict gets his daily dose, he can lead a normal life or he gets a substitute dose like methadone or something. 
whereas uh, cocaine um, just produces both mental and moral deter and physical deterioration the more of it you take. So it is a more difficult problem. I mean, the, the notion that marijuana is addictive, I think, or seriously addictive, and maybe for some people, but it is really belied by uh, the age distribution of users uh, from the time they started collecting statistics. An overwhelming number, percentage of the users are people in their 20s and 30s. There are very few 40, 50, and 60-year-old marijuana users. They, it's a rite of passage that people grow out of which would not be the case if there were serious physical addiction, I don't think. Yeah, anything else? Well, thank well, you very well, much. Well, I thank you. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.